So we're returning to the Middle East today and we're looking at reserves. We think they should not be kept as a state secret. These numbers are not commercially sensitive. They are politicised. But really, I think the earth needs to understand how much oil and gas we've got, how fast we're using it and how much is left. We'll look at the difference between the reserves categories and on the right there you can see the prospective resources, contingent resources and reserves. So in previous videos we've looked at all of the Middle East. In total we've got over 118 minutes of it. There's a link below which will take you to our playlist. 118 minutes, that's better than a Hollywood blockbuster. Hmm, it's a lot more informative as well. There's some of the titles you can see on the right hand side there. Ah, reserves. Nothing could be easier. Now here's the Chinese version of the PRMS, or the Petroleum Resources Management System. The various categories. Reserves, this is if we've got a commercially producing field. Subcommercial, or yet to be proven commercial, yet to uh, go through FID. These are contingent resources, not reserves, resources. And likewise, if they haven't been drilled yet, they haven't been discovered. So therefore, they're in this category here, prospective resources. So different tiers within there, but essentially it's these three classes that we're going to have a look at today. So if we look at the sources of information that we have, here are some collated and captured in trove. And we're going to show some interesting trends and findings. These are just examples. Sources uh, include peer-reviewed academic papers, oil and gas journal, GeoExpro, CC Carto, AAPG memoirs, textbooks, averages of a variety of sources, all sorts of information that we've pulled together within Trove. What numbers are quoted? Well, herein lies the problem. We're talking about 2P reserves, which are the, uh, the second band, the second tier here of reserves so they are proven and probable reserves that's what we often use as being sort of the best single number occasionally uh, people get confused and talk about remaining reserves i.e this is what's left after this particular date and you always must state the date ultimate recoverable reserves that's what the field will do from start to finish in its entirety Numbers are sometimes quoted as millions of barrels of oil or millions of barrels of oil equivalent or BCF, billions of cubic feet, if it's gas. Sometimes there's a confusion and stow it. The stock tank oil initially in place is quoted. Very confusing. That's not even contingent resource because you're not going to get all of the oil out of the ground. You're only going to get a percentage of it. And uh, it gets very confusing when you see prospective resources, sometimes referred to as reserves, and yet they haven't been drilled yet. So we don't even know if it's real or not. Many of them turn out to be dry holes. Here now we've got Abquake. And what we've tried to do here, we've put a, a variety of sources and we've put them in in terms of the reserves that have been quoted in billions of barrels. So initially sort of eight billion barrels and then in a more recent publication here that dropped down to about four billion. We don't know. Was that actually intended as remaining reserves? Then you can see a 1997 paper. They shoot up CC Carto. Not sure of the date on that one. Various textbooks, not quoted on this particular one. Alternative data sources, we found other regions and other sources of information on reserves. 2003 APG, and then uh, this paper here in 2014. The minimum reserves, around about 3.86 billion barrels. The maximum, 18.7. If we take an average, 10.87 billion barrels at Abquag. Now, the early estimates, they appear to be understated, but there is a wide range. And although the uh, oil and gas journal, these green ones over here on the left, seem to, to take a dive, we're sort of thinking that reserves, ultimate recovered reserves for Abquake, looking to be around about 11 billion barrels. There's the information that we have in trove on the field. If we look at Berry, similar story. Initially, low estimates here. These are quoted in the Oil and Gas Journal. And then some very, very high numbers quoted. And uh, we get a range of about 5 to 18, with an average of around about 10 billion barrels. Lots of information on the berry field in Trove, if you want to have a look at that. Gawa, the largest oil field in the world. A latest reserves estimate here of just, what, about 12 billion barrels. Very, very anomalously low. 
But a generally stable trend over time, the oil and gas journal reserves quotes here, and they steadily go down and wonder if they're actually uh, remaining reserves and going down each year with production. Anyway, what number do we use here? An average of around about 63 billion barrels? Could be more. We've done a video on Gawar and uh, there's a lot of information in that video. Well worth a watch. Safanaya, another one we've done a video on. Here's the reserves history and plotted out all of these numbers and all the sources all available within Trove. A minimum of uh, nearly 12, a maximum of 56 and an average of 26. Similarly, you know, there's been early estimates understated and, and uh, we'll go on and have a look why reserves may change through time. But what can we say about this? Well, 20 to 30 billion barrels for Safonaya doesn't seem unreasonable. So why do reserves change? Well, reservoirs can both overperform and underperform. Quite a number do underperform, but uh, every now and again we do get one that really, uh, really does excel. Development plans can change. There can be the addition of more wells, closer well spacings, more platforms, horizontal wells, multi-fract wells. Uh, we can introduce water, we can gas flood, we can do all sorts of things. There's geopolitics, uh, things like sanctions, very topical, tariffs, embargoes, and uh, markets change. So they can all affect what reserves are. And of course, ultimately, that's uh, oil price that's changing it. Change of operator. Now, low cost operators coming in when a field is mature, they can extend the life of the field. Economics obviously play a major part in reserves, world oil prices, tax changes, as we've witnessed in the UK recently, and uh, operating costs, they, they can all curtail a field's production prematurely, or equally, if uh, prices go up, it can extend the life and increase the reserves. Technology advances have definitely been involved in changing the reserves picture over the last 50 years. 3D seismic, extended reach drilling, horizontal multifracts, lots of technologies. And uh, where are we going to go with AI in the future? If we look at reserves, well, somebody would have looked at the US declining production profile from around about the mid-1980s and seeing it going down, down and down. And then, of course, along comes shale. Production has really, really gone up. And, of course, with it, so has the ultimate recoverable reserves for the United States. But is it a case of running to stand still? Yes, it's always been the case that when you stack profiles like this, they get steeper and steeper and steeper. But 50% of horizontal production are from wells that are less than 18 months old and they decline very very steeply and, and then they have this long long tail but they're producing at very very low volume so in order to sustain this you just have to keep on investing have to keep on drilling and fracking and completing these wells this data from uh, nova labs the other variable we get is oil price difficult to plan when you've got a commodity price that's going up and down like a helter-skelter. And even when you uh, adjust the uh, oil price for inflation, it's still a fairly volatile picture that you get. Now, a lot of oil fields, you're talking about lead times of many years, perhaps as, as much as a, a decade and field life that can be several decades long. What are you going to get at various stages for your investment? Recently, well, we've seen that the volatility can be affected by things like global politics. At the time, 14th of April 2025 here, the Brent crude down at $65 a barrel. People are saying the new norm is $62 a barrel. But $62 a barrel is probably not going to cover the operating expenses of a deep water project. Whereas if you have an onshore Saudi Arabia field, you may actually have single digit operating expenses. So less than $10 a barrel, maybe as low as $3 a barrel. Lots of profit to be made at uh, the new norm, but not everywhere. Now, one of the things that we have a, a real problem with at Trove is when we see reserves quoted on a discovery. Now, 
very often this is just a, a pre-drill model, so some seismic and interpretation and an expectation. And I'm not having a go at this particular well or indeed the operator, but you know it's the model that they've come up with. There could be oil in all of these zones here. They don't they don't know. And then they're going to drill an eight and a half inch diameter well that's going to penetrate this. They're going to log it and they're going to from there assess just how big the size of this thing is. Well, in some cases operators will go in and they will just hype it they will just make up numbers plug in those reserves to the pre-drill model without reworking it and there's not an awful lot you can do if you've only got one single data point in an enormous field then there's the the banker's burn when you put the well on production uh, you actually test it and look for all the parameters of how quickly the pressures build up. Do they go back to the initial conditions or is there any signs of depletion? That gives you some indication of the size. But very often at the end of that drill stem testing sequence, I actually go for what's called a banker's burn. And that's where you try and open everything up and try and give as big a flare as you possibly can to actually generate the biggest numbers. So 10,000 barrels of oil per day. Well, maybe for five minutes, but how long might that be sustained for? We don't have no it's done why well it pumps up the share price and some people make some money on the back of that but there isn't lateral control and it is a tricky one we like to see appraisal wells we like to see some aerial distribution of well data points it can be that what looks like initial huge discovery actually gets uh, written down quite substantially and we've had quite a number of examples of that in recent videos our observations well Reserves are generally poorly quoted. Experts in the industry, they know what they're talking about, but very often commentators outside the industry, they don't really understand the difference between reserves, resources, prospective resources, etc. Quite often understood. If you are going to talk about remaining reserves, it must always be quoted at a date. For a, a URR or ultimate recoverable reserves, you do need it to actually get a recovery factor, work out, well, how much of the original oil in place is actually going to ultimately be recovered. That is your recovery factor. And uh, it's really, you only ever really find out what it is on the last day of production. And that assumes that you actually have a good handle on how big the oil in place figure is. There may be good reasons why reserves go up and down. We touched on some of the parameters that affect it. Different assessments yield different answers. Even CPRs, uh, we saw a recent example from uh, offshore Peru where different CPRs with different data yielded quite different results. Ultimately, we don't know the ultimate recoverable reserve until the last barrel is produced. But with all the uncertainty in the world today and with the desire to, to move towards a net zero and the energy transition, we do need to have a good estimate on reserves so that we can actually plan replacement energy sources. They aren't going to come quickly and they're not going to come cheap. One area I think that's very, very exciting for the future is redeveloping old fields. Fields that have been decommissioned, have been abandoned, they produce their, their last barrels. But in time, what happens to them? Repressurize? Resaturate? With Doan and Dumbarton, we did a video. It's available out on the channel. And uh, the headline there, how to treble reserves by redeveloping an abandoned oil field. And this is the story of in the North Sea when the Donan field actually was redeveloped as uh, Dumbarton. Although in some quarters it's still known as Donan. So what do you think? Should reserves information, should the data be more transparent? Should countries be uh, expected to let everybody know, their suppliers, the world in general, just how much remaining reserves there are? Leave your comments below. Be interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching. I hope you found that interesting. Please hit the like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.